Epic Games has demonstrated a snippet of the rendering technology powering Unreal Engine 5, running on the PS5, and it is indeed quite different than anything we've seen before. The demo showcases scenes with realistic lighting, where light and color bounce around the scene illuminating the darkness. At the same time, the light is highlighting an extremely high level of detail in the environment, on the rocks themselves, and the scenery that has not been seen in games before. How is this all possible? At the core of this demo are two different technologies. Lumen, a system for generating real-time global illumination or bounced lighting, and Nanite, an utterly new way for geometry or models to be rendered in video games. To start with Lumen, it is a non-triangle ray-traced based version of bounced lighting that uses other types of tracing to achieve its final look. Bounce lighting is simply the light that is distributed around a game scene after the first hit of lighting. So the sun hits a surface like a rock, informing how it should be shaded. And then that lighting from the rock, affected by its color, is sent off in other directions as a bounce. The Lumen system in Unreal Engine 5 promises some rather radical transformations of scene lighting in real time, probably best seen in the immediate difference when the demo turns off Lumen in one frame and then turns it on in another. Notice how the entire frame is filled with light nearly immediately after the global illumination is set to on. Many games do feature forms of global illumination. In the past though, they were primarily purely static through a system called light maps. With light maps, offline ray tracing is done and that information from that ray tracing is stored into textures and applied to a game scene. With this, a scene has global illumination but lights cannot move and the lighting and objects affected by it are completely static. The lighting is essentially attached to the surface of the objects in the game scene. So there's a single time of day usually used or lighting just doesn't really change. In addition to this, this light map only affects diffuse lighting. So specular lighting, which are reflections like those found on metals, water, and other shiny materials have to be done in a different manner. Those reflections themselves are done often either through cube maps, which are static captures of the screen, or cube maps modified by screen space reflections, where the reflections will disappear when they're no longer in the camera view. These techniques are ubiquitous in games today, but they have natural constraints on the realisms of games lighting and how interactive or dynamic a world can be with such a lighting system. There is a trade-off that developers make in accuracy of indirect lighting for static objects when they opt for dynamic lighting in games. One answer to this is to utilize triangle ray tracing to solve this problem, like found in DirectX ray tracing. By essentially doing these calculations for bouncing rays of light against the geometry in real time, in lieu of systems that are purely static or break like screen space reflections. This works really well from a quality perspective as games like Metro Exodus show us, but the cost is significant for that dynamism. Ray tracing is not cheap, and given how expensive it is, even the next generation consoles with their big GPUs will not universally switch to this technique. It may not be the solution for every game out there with their specific design goals. Lumen is another real-time alternative then to offline light map global illumination with a lessened cost to full-on ray tracing. It uses a combination of tracing techniques to render the final image. Lumen looks to provide multiple bounces of indirect lighting for the sunlight. So in this scene, as the roof caves in, you can see a bounce of light hitting the wall and other bounces as well as light slowly fills the room after the wall caves in. Lumen also looks to provide indirect lighting from smaller lights, like the flashlight of the main character when it's shined at the wall here. If you notice, not just the area hit by the light is lit up, as outside of its cone of light, the floor and a number of objects in the room likewise have that bluish white color. As a part of this, specular reflections can also be seen in the bounced lighting. Like here, the shiny part on the vases on the ground. Or in this scene, you can see specular reflections on the statues, where on their shields, you can see the reflection of the indirect lighting outside of the camera view. So why this technique instead of triangle ray tracing? As mentioned, the cost of ray tracing is intense. Lumen, I think, will be a cost-saving measure, and the demo gives us clues as to how that is the case. The combination of techniques that Lumen uses is simple. To cover bounced lighting from larger objects and surfaces, Lumen does not trace triangles, 
but voxels, which are boxy representations of the scene geometry. For medium-sized object, Lumen then traces against something called signed distance fields, which are another slightly simplified version of the scene geometry. And then the smallest details in this demo scene are traced in screen space, much like the screen space global illumination we have seen demoed in Gears of War 5 on Xbox Series X. By utilizing varying levels of detail for object size, and also utilizing screen space information for the most complex smaller details, Lumen saves on GPU time versus something like hardware triangle ray tracing. That of course has its own set of trade-offs. By utilizing screen space information for smaller details, that means there are also similar disocclusion artifacts like that which we see with screen space reflections, but found in the bounce lighting itself. Disocclusion is when an object is in front of another object in the distance and then the object occluding moves out of the way, revealing that object again in the distance. In instances in this demo when that occurs, like around the main character's head in the scene, you can see how the lighting on the distance wall here, when uncovered, changes. So here you can see the shadow in the global illumination being added in after the head moves out of the way. You can see that as well along the sides of the frame in this shot, Notice how the darkening in the shadow slides in and out of existence as the camera moves. This tells us that parts of the global illumination technology here leverage screen space information. Another key way performance is maintained is based upon temporal accumulation of bounce lighting. So accumulating multiple bounces of light over time. This is something that is also used in triangle ray tracing. For example, as the light moves around the screen in the beginning of the demo, and if you watch it attentively, you can see that the bounce lighting itself, away from the direct lighting, is moving at a staggered rate. So it has a bit of latency. The developers mention quote unquote infinite bounces, which reminds me a bit of surface caching, which is a way to store light on geometry over time in a sort of feedback loop that allows for many bounces of diffuse lighting. But it can induce a bit of latency when the light rapidly moves. Some of this latency can be seen later in the demo, actually. In this scene, for example, the camera cuts from one shot to another, and we see the statues as sunlight crosses the floor. If you flip between the first few frames after the camera cut, you can see that the occlusion of the bounce light is actually only added in after a few frames after that camera cut. Like here in the corner of the screen, where the initial frame after the camera cut has no shadow in the bounce light and the frame thereafter adds it in. It also looks a little bit like screen space adjustments to the global illumination are being added in over time, like the feet of these statues here, where it kind of fills in an area between the statues with darkness over time, which reminds me visually of other screen space GI techniques that I've seen. The final result is what counts though, and in the end, the indirect lighting in this demo is one of its highlights. But that is just the first new technology shown off in the demo. In my opinion, the most revolutionary part of this demo is in Nanite. Nanite is a form of micro polygon rendering, which is a way to represent geometry or game models on the screen. Traditionally, game models, like character models for example, have an extremely highly detailed model made by artists, which is too expensive for real-time rendering generally at various view distances, or if there would be more objects on the screen than just the character model. So developers then take that high quality model and reduce the amount of polygons in it to a number which runs better in real time at most camera distances or where there's other objects on screen. The detail from the original really high quality model missing in the lower quality model is then compressed into a texture called a normal map which have limited overall resolution. These textures are then applied on top of the low quality in-game model to make it look like it has more geometric detail than it really does. But this is just one model, of course. It would be a waste to have this model rendering all the time in the game. For example, if the model only takes up 20 by 20 pixels and is still thousands of polygons with 2K normal maps, then we're wasting a lot of performance and texture budget on something that is barely visible. So game developers produce multiple lower level of detail variations of this model, where the lower resolution textures lower resolution normal maps, simplified materials, and less geometry is used. The game then flips between these various versions of the model depending upon camera distance usually, and maybe even reserving the highest quality possible only for cutscenes. 
there are ways to modify this pipeline in real time by utilizing hardware tessellation already found in GPUs. Here utilizing a displacement map, geometry can be extrapolated on in a vertical direction, essentially adding in displaced detail. So like here in Battlefront 1 on Frostbite, where the ground has an added bumpiness and detail due to the tessellation displacement. Or you have the ability for edges to be turned into curves in a variety of ways, like you see here in Metro Exodus, where the turn wheel handle on this door here without tessellation like you found out in the console version has obvious edges. Then you can add on top of that so-called Fong tessellation found on the PC that rounds it out. Both these systems work out well enough, but they have limitations. Fong tessellation can over tessellate certain faces and aspects of the model where tessellation is perhaps only needed on grazing edges. The displacement maps I had mentioned for objects on the ground, for example, like we saw in Battlefront, can have the limitation of having a very visible tessellation line. So you can move the camera backward and forward and see the ground almost bubbling or boiling as the terrain warps to fit the shape dictated by the height map. This can be extreme in games like Anthem. Then you have the fact that height maps cannot represent horizontal object detail, so it can really only tessellate detail present in a single direction meaning you won't have overhangs of detail being displaced, like a rock placed on top of the ground and not in it. Height map based displacement would have to represent that rock detail with a gradation, which is of course unnatural as it would look like there's a slope. This is the traditional system of how game geometry can be made and represented. Micro polygons, on the other hand, has been a system that's been primarily developed for offline CGI rendering in films and has yet to be found in any game to my knowledge. The starting point is the same, but the execution in game is different. Models are authored at that same very high quality with millions of polygons per model, but no in-game lower quality model with normal maps is created. Rather an 8K albedo texture to describe the object's primary color, an 8K metalness texture to describe its material type, and then an 8K tiling detailed normal map, not to be confused with that bespoke normal map, that would create extremely fine detail, like a hair-thin scratch on a piece of metal. These are all brought in intelligently through virtual texturing to keep GPU memory requirements down. As the engine is rendering in real time, the geometric detail making up that ultra high quality model is scaled up and down based upon the size of the model or the size of parts of the model that it takes up in screen space. Since it's tied to pixel amount and screen size, there is no more hard cutoff when you will see the LOD of a model switch as we could see in the previous system. Likewise, it should ideally not have that boiling look like you could see with standard displacement map tessellation in a game like Battlefront. And lastly, it can represent horizontal expansion and decimations of detail. So it can have individual rocks on the ground and those increasing or decreasing their quality in a natural way. With such highly detailed models, much of their detail would disappear or look unrealistic unless they were accurately shadowed. This is something we've seen with triangle ray tracing in games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare, where more accurate shadowing allows all the geometric detail on the game models to stand out more because standard shadow maps are too low resolution to capture small detail. In lieu of triangle hardware ray tracing, like that found in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, this UE5 demo on PlayStation 5 utilizes screen space shadows like we've seen in current generation games to cover small details, which is then combined with a virtualized shadow map system. Since Nanite does geometry differently than before by adjusting the amount of triangles to be aligned with the amount of pixels they take up in screen space, this can be leveraged to enable a unique virtualized shadow map technique that this demo also uses. Instead of having fixed shadow resolution for a shadow map attached to a light where a developer dials in the shadow map resolution based upon the scene budget and what looks good from a certain distance, the virtual shadow map system can bring in shadow map information that corresponds with the size of the shadow in screen pixels in a one to one ratio. Shadow map resolution aligns with screen resolution. So a shadow texel per screen pixel. This makes for razor sharp shadows in the game scene that align very well with the geometry, 
basically looking like an ultra high res 16K shadow map. This would be very unrealistic looking though in general, and much like a stencil shadow you would see in a game like Doom 3, so Epic Games here leveraged lessons that they learned from denoising techniques for ray trace shadows to then filter this virtualized shadow map to get a penumbra shadow effect. So shadows become softer and more diffuse further away from the casting point. In the end, this micro polygon method has a large difference for asset creation as level of detail versions of models and normal maps no longer have to be authored. So it saves time, memory, and even draw calls for the various versions. Though it is still yet to be seen how much memory these large models will actually cost. Currently in the demo, we saw micro polygon rendering definitely applying to those environmental models present, like the rocks all over the place or the statues. But some areas of this micro polygon renderer have yet to be explained. For example, how does it work on what are termed as skinned geometry? So geometry that can deform and animate like a character model. Is it in use there as well? Or how does it apply to rendering things like hair or foliage? Foliage moves a lot and has many small thin details. And individual hairs are actually much smaller than a pixel width usually. So it falls out of the render everything that your eyes can see model that micro polygons achieve. Usually objects like foliage or hair are rendered as transparent textures on triangles or quad fins attached to a head or attached to a tree trunk. So how does micro polygon rendering tie into this? Then I'm curious about performance. The demo here was technically running with dynamic resolution scaling at 30 FPS and then temporal upsampling that internal resolution to 4K. Epic told us that the internal rendering resolution was mostly 1440p throughout the demo on the PlayStation 5. So this technology must indeed have a high performance cost. And since it scales geometry detail with resolution, that means resolution scaling in games is now even more expensive than before with this technique. So if you wanted to achieve 60 FPS with this technique in this demo on a PS5, what would it require in terms of resolution? Would you have to half the resolution? So it would be a sub 1080p at 60 FPS? What about GPUs less powerful than the PS5? How would something like a PS4 Pro run this if it's already 1440p 30 on the PS5? If it is indeed this expensive, perhaps not every game would want to utilize it to make this resolution or frame rate trade-off that it requires, and instead such games would want to utilize more traditional geometry rendering. Lastly, I wonder about if it's overly expensive by design. In rendering, there's the so-called quad overshade problem. GPUs render in pixel quads. If a triangle is the size of a pixel or smaller, you end up spending the rendering time shading all four pixels of that quad and discarding the other three. The GPU is doing a lot of work here and a lot of it for something that is not even going to be used or visible contributing to that end image. According to Epic Games, this micro polygon renderer of theirs will be producing pixel sized triangles and probably more than a few of them. So either this engine is embracing an inefficient usage of the hardware for the gain in the detail and the gain from that lack of level of detail switching, or they are somehow avoiding this massive inefficiency in some way that we don't know about. But that is really all I can say without going into too much detail or without theorizing on some area that I don't have any evidence for. Lumen looks to be an interesting and cheaper alternative to full ray tracing, but I find the actual next generation difference in Nanite which is a completely new and different way for games to achieve very high detail. Is it the future of rendering geometry? Time will tell as the generation goes on, but I'm excited that Epic took the step to put something that was only used in CGI into the realm of the real time. And until then, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, then consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to enable more content like this in the future, support Digital Foundry on Patreon to help us out and get access to all of our videos in high quality for download. If you want to talk to me about UE5 or micro polygons, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.